Hey everybody, um, we are going to get started in a couple minutes here. We just want to make sure all the technology is working. So if you can see the slides, so you should see Tennessee's Medicaid block grant proposal. And if you can hear me, if you could just type that into the chat box. And like I said, we'll get started in just a few minutes. Thank you.
Hey everyone, um, we're going to get started in just about two minutes. We just want to do one more sound check before we get going. Um, so if you can see the screen, you should see it say Tennessee's Medicaid block grant proposal. And if you can hear me, uh, please just type that in the chat box. Again, we'll get started in about two minutes. Thank you. Hey everyone, we're going to go ahead and get started. Thank you guys so much for joining us today. We're so glad to have you guys all on this webinar to talk more about Tennessee's Medicaid block grant proposal. My name is Kyla Franks. I'm the Director of Medicaid Policy Advocacy at the Tennessee Justice Center. Um, and presenting with me today is Gordon Bonnieman, a staff attorney uh, at the Tennessee Justice Center. So we're uh, glad to talk to you today. We're going to have this webinar as an hour long. We'll try to leave time for questions at the end. We may not get to all of your questions, in which case please follow up and ask us. Uh, you can feel free to type them in the chat box and we can follow up with you afterwards. Um, if you want your uh, question to be private just to us, you can type that into the Q&A box, which is separate from the chat box. So the Q&A box um, will just come to us at the, at the Tennessee Justice Center. So feel free to ask us any question and then we'll try and answer it in the Q&A uh, session. As for the chat box, that will go to everyone. So um, you, if you type in there, that will go to all the people who are on this call. Um, if uh, I hope we had a couple questions in the chat box. If people are on mute, yes, everyone is on mute on this call. So if you have a question, please just type it into the Q&A box. Um, so we are also recording this webinar. If you miss anything and want to you know, rewatch uh, or anything like that, we'll be sending out the recording and the PowerPoint slides after the call. So those will be shared. Um, along with other talking points as well. So no need to write frantically. We will be following up with that information as well. Um, I also just want to say if we have any media who are on the line, we want to make sure that you know this call is off the record. So you can listen for, uh, it's on background, so you can listen for background information. But let me know if you want a statement uh, or quote for your article. But this is on background. All right, so getting into it today. Um, what we're going to be talking about is what you need to know about Tennessee's Medicaid block grant proposal. We'll first go through background and context, then we'll explain the block grant proposal, what's in it and what it means, and then we'll talk about action steps, how you can oppose this proposal specifically during the comment period. We're currently in the state comment period and everyone should submit comments about this proposal. So we'll give some guidance about what should be in those comments um, and how you can take other action to oppose this harmful proposal. And then again, at the end, um, there'll be time for question and answer. 
So without any further ado, we have a lot of information to cover. Uh, we'll go ahead and get started and I'll turn it over to Gordon. Okay, thank you, Kyla. Um, just to explain how we got to where we are now, um, it, it's good to know how the current TenCare program operates. Medicaid, uh, as probably most people on the, the, the call are aware, uh, is a federal state partnership that is over 50 years old. All states participate in it. Um, Congress created the basic structure um, in 1965 and the federal government provides 65 percent, nearly two-thirds of the cost of TenCare services. 25 years ago, we applied for and received what's known as an 1115 waiver, which allows Tennessee uh, to operate the program slightly differently than uh, it would otherwise be required by the federal law. And uh, most of the program is still governed by the law. Only a couple of sections are waived or we are exempted from. And the block grant waiver that we're talking about now is actually an, being submitted to the Federal Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, uh, commonly referred to as CMS, as a, an amendment to the current waiver that's been in place for 25 years and has been frequently amended. In fact, this will be amendment number 42 if it's approved. Um, the structure of Medicaid is one in which the, the federal government, Congress in the first instance passing the statute and then CMS promulgating regulations have created basically the parameters for the program. It includes uh, numerous safeguards for patients, enrollees, and minimum standards which the state uh, must uh, meet. The state actually administers the program even though it's primarily federally funded, uh, but CMS provide some oversight, even though in the first instance it's the state that actually administers the program and sets most of the policy. It's important for, I think, everyone to understand that when we're talking about Medicaid in Tennessee, we're talking about um, the, the single most important health program in the state and uh, its important implications for the rest of the state budget. TenCare covers 1.4 million people. Uh, that is not just any 1.4, but it's um, made up of populations which Congress uh, and the state wanted, have wanted to protect traditionally because of their vulnerability. It's half of all Tennessee children are enrolled in the program, over half of the births um, in the state and infants uh, are covered by TenCare. 60%, over 60% of people in nursing homes in Tennessee or receiving home and community-based community services through uh, what's known as the Ten Care Choices Program, 60% of those people, most of whom are frail elderly, um, are covered by this program. Medicaid is the principal, uh, the primary source of coverage for families living in rural areas. Many people think of it as primarily an urban program, and it's certainly important in our cities, but it is really the bulwark of coverage in rural areas, uh, primarily in areas where uh, employment uh, often does not come bring with it employer-sponsored insurance. And those dollars that flow to people who are enrolled in rural areas ultimately flow out uh, into hospitals, physicians' offices, local drug stores, the whole panoply of health services uh, throughout the state are vitally supported by Medicaid and that's particularly true in rural areas. And then finally, it's important to note that one in every five dollars uh, appropriated in the state budget comes in the form of federal Medicaid match. So it, it is vitally important uh, to all of the activities, including educational activities, uh, that are funded by the state government because those dollars, uh, federal dollars, make it possible for the state to spend its own dollars someplace else. So uh, during the legislative session that ended uh, last spring, uh, the 
state legislature passed a bill uh, with the support of the governor uh, requiring Governor Lee's administration to submit an amendment to the current 10 care waiver asking for a Medicaid block grant. Uh, by the terms of the law, the deadline for submitting that to CMS is November 20th, uh, immediately before Thanksgiving. The bill itself contained very few details. Um, one thing to understand about this is that, that block grants have been talked about in the Medicaid context for three decades now, but no one has ever actually seen one. Um, and therefore, uh, because the bill was so vague, it leaves a lot of latitude to the Lee administration to define um, what it's going to ask for CMS to approve. On September 17th, last week, the state released the proposal, and um, that starts a 30-day state comment period. By federal regulation, amendments to our 1115 waiver, as it's known, the 10 care waiver, have to be posted by the state for public comment for 30 days. The state has to hold hearings, uh, which we'll talk about later, and it has to uh, consider those comments before it um, finalizes the proposal that it sends to CMS. Once it sends the waiver proposal to a requirement request to CMS, that starts a second 30-day period um, for comment uh, through the federal comment website. And that is um, a very important stage which we'll talk about in a moment. There is um, a lag time between when uh, the State comment period closes here, uh, which will be in uh, mid-October, and when the federal comment period will open because the state has to then finalize it, send it to CMS, uh, some other things occur before CMS posts it. So that will probably be in December or uh, January that we expect to see the federal comment period. And again, we'll talk about that in just a moment. Uh, this is the first state in the 50-year history of the program to seek, seek a block grant, and that's quite a radical change. And I think it's important uh, throughout the coming months to just keep asking ourselves, why has no other state done this, and why did Tennessee not do it until the legislature decided it would be a good idea? So there are six main takeaways, and again, you'll get these slides. You don't have to write all this down, but the, the main takeaways that we want to leave you with are that uh, whatever else is said about it and the block grant proposal that was released is written in a uh, very upbeat and positive way, uh, touting its benefits to the state. Um, but the fact of the matter is that it, it's quite concerning um, and the first reason why it's so concerning is that it represents a $2 billion cut in the 10 care program. And just to put that in scale, currently the budget is about $12 billion. And um, you may have seen a quote attributed to Governor Lee in which he said that the state's goal is to achieve upwards of $1 billion in uh, savings that would translate into $1 billion of additional federal money that the state would be able to use. The problem with that is that these are not new dollars. These are dollars that are being taken out of the current spending, out of the, out of the system, um, or what, what the state would otherwise be spending. And the, what's being proposed is that the state would keep half the savings and the federal government would keep half the savings. So in order for the state to realize $1 billion in savings, uh, it would have to cut $2 billion from what the projected needs of the program would be. Uh, so that's the most important thing, if you remember nothing else. Um, the second thing which is related to that is that these cuts uh, will come from the sickest patients, and we're going to talk about that a little bit more, but um, it's, um, it's the nature of these things that, that it's the people who are most costly to pay for them. The block grant 
dramatically weakens accountability of state government and it's an invitation to fraud and abuse by managed care contractors. We have a history which we'll discuss in a moment. Um, that history is such that if you were looking around at the 50 states in the District of Columbia to decide, well, let's try out this block grant idea. It's going to give a blank check to whoever gets the block grant. Um, which state would we pick? You probably wouldn't pick Tennessee given our history, which we'll talk about in a moment. Um, and then finally, the, the last two points that we want folks to understand is that um, this is not a, a proposal to address the real concerns that have put health care at the top of the worries of Tennessee voters, according to, to recent polls. Uh, it just doesn't speak to that. Um, and the reason is that it's not so much a policy proposal as it is it started life as a political gimmick in the legislature. Um, where the majority felt like they had to be concerned about the, the perception that they didn't have a plan for health reform, and so they came up with this. Um, but let's, let's talk in more detail about each of these things. Um, as I mentioned a moment ago, the, the block grant, in order for the state to achieve its target of a billion dollars, since half of any savings go to the federal government, it's really a $2 billion cut. And, um, it represents a transfer out of the current system to state and federal government. Uh, that money that would have otherwise been spent on patients and as revenue for health care providers will now flow to government. Um, one problem with that is that the state, although it's claimed that, that it, the state will achieve these savings from being more efficient, as the block grant itself points out, Tennessee already operates one of the most cost-effective Medicaid programs in the nation. Our expenditures per enrollee are among the lowest, um, we're among the five lowest cost Medicaid programs in the 50 states. So it's not like there's a lot of, of generosity or surplus there to be trimmed. Um, the only way to get those savings is going to be to cut uh, the services that are being provided to the state's most vulnerable patients. And the reason why we say the most vulnerable or the sickest patients is because it's the nature of these things. Um, it's the Willie Sutton principle. You'll remember that Willie Sutton was the bank robber when he, who when arrested asked why he robbed banks. He said, well, that's where they keep the money. Um, if you want to take money out of the Medicaid program, you inevitably are forced to go to where that money is spent, and that's on the sickest patients. Something like 10% uh, of the population accounts for over half or two-thirds of health care expenditures in a year. Most of us are fortunate we don't get sick. If we do, it's minor. Uh, on the other hand, if we are in an accident, uh, we are unfortunate enough to contract a life-threatening disease, then suddenly the resources that we need, the services that we use, the treatment that has to be paid for uh, goes way up, and that's where the expenditures are. So for example, if you were to do as the state did in the past, cut hospital care from now it's based on what you need to an arbitrary limit such as 14 days as it was 25 years ago, um, most of us thank goodness, we'll never need any time in the hospital in the year, uh, much less 14 days. But when you know uh, how sick you have to be to stay in the hospital for more than 14 days, you realize that uh, that kind of numerical cap, which is what this waiver would envision, uh, that or other limitations, um, would come out of the the, the care of the very sickest people. Um, the proposal has some reassurances that there's no intention to cut people off who are now eligible for ten care and that it won't eliminate services that ten care now covers. Um, but what it does say is that it wants the flexibility to reduce the amount of care a patient could receive. Example, 
might only cover one drug in a class. So to take an example that immediately comes to mind, hepatitis C. There are new products that have come on the market in the past decade that are very costly, but that are very effective, that actually cure the disease and um, ultimately are cost effective over time. Uh, it's likely that those would be the first to go and people would be relegated to receiving medications that are much less effect effective um, and possibly, in, without the, the really effective drugs, could lead uh, to the loss of their liver function um, and death. So um, th that's a quite a serious proposal. Um, that is laid out explicitly. Other cuts um, to services aren't specified, but the authority would be to literally reduce those benefits to, uh, to cite an absurd example, but one that would technically be possible to one day in the hospital a year. I think we've already made the point that, that it's the people with the greatest need that are, that are most at risk uh, because of the nature of these cuts. Um, it's important from a taxpayer standpoint uh, to understand how it significantly this reduces accountability of government. Um, in a Medicaid managed care program, the government pays for services in advance. At the beginning of each month, it pays what's equivalent to an insurance premium to the managed care contractors like Blue Cross or Amerigroup. Um, and those contractors are then expected to have a network of providers that participate, that people can go to when they get sick, that participate in the Medicaid program in that particular plan. And they have to meet certain standards in terms of, of their financial solvency, uh, the timeliness with which they pay the providers, um, and the quality of the services that they provide to patients. The proposal would eliminate that, um, and it would eliminate federal oversight of the state. So there are two, two ways in which this weakens accountability. Um, one is that, and the waiver speaks of this in terms of just getting rid of federal approval, but it does more than that. Uh, the state would be able to reduce benefits and weaken other patient safeguards uh, with not just wouldn't have to go to CMS to get permission, but importantly, the standards themselves would, would go away, would be eliminated. So it's, it's kind of the equivalent of saying we're not only going to get rid of the highway patrol, uh, with their radar guns to check savings, but check on speeding, but we're going to do away with speed limits altogether. Uh, that's really the danger here as much as the elimination of federal oversight. And as I mentioned, it would eliminate um, federal restrictions on uh, the managed care contractors. The managed care contractors we have now are sound and they meet um, solvency standards and they meet prompt payment standards and they meet network adequacy stand standards, although there are even with the current safeguards in place, there are significant problems for many patients being able to get access to uh, certain types of providers in the networks because the networks are not as strong as they need to be. But generally, um, we came through a period 20 years ago where we had uh, two major MCOs that failed and left providers unpaid and along the way left patients uh, without being able to get care because no one would take uh, their uh, MCO because they knew the providers knew they wouldn't get paid. It was a scandal. There was a lot of abuse. Um, there was cronyism. And if you relax uh, the standards, it's almost certain that we will end up back there um, because the contracts will go to the lowest bidder and one way to have be the lowest bidder is to have inadequate networks or so-called paper networks where you show that people have signed, providers have signed up to serve your patients, but in fact 
um, that they're not there. And uh, so it's just an invitation uh, to fraud and abuse. And um, when we say that TenCare is the, the last state agency that should be given this kind of latitude, it's not just the history with the MCOs. It has to do with the uh, giving them the discretion to cut back on services and pursue savings. I mean, this is a, this is a state that was the last one to bring uh, a new federally mandated computer system online. Um, just came online in March of this year. It still has problems. It started out as a $37 million contract and it had $400 million in cost overruns. This is not um, a, a, a great credential for the program to have. In the last two years, TenCare cut off 200,000 children, the great majority of whom were still eligible. And people on Social Security pensions continue to suddenly find that the money is being taken out of their checks for Medicare premiums that TenCare was supposed to be paying because TenCare mistakenly stopped making the payments with no advance notice. And this has been a chronic problem uh, for at least two years. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, polling indicates that among voters, health care is now at the top of the list. And um, there are many aspects to that. Um, there, as many of you know, there's a lawsuit that Tennessee and several other states brought out in Texas seeking to strike down the Affordable Care Act and with it the protections for people with pre-existing conditions until the Affordable Care Act was adopted and took effect, uh, insurance companies could and did uh, discriminate against people with pre-existing conditions. One of three Tennesseans uh, has a pre-existing condition. What does that mean? Well, it means diabetes or heart conditions or other things that make, make you more likely to have insurance claims and therefore insurers either don't want to cover you at all or they charge you exorbitant premiums or they refuse to cover the things that are most likely uh, to incur medical expenses and for which you most need insurance. Uh, the majority of Tennessee families, the overwhelming majority of Tennessee families have somebody, some family member who has a pre-existing condition. And so this is a looming threat that, that is extremely dangerous. Uh, the district court in Texas struck down the provision of the law, but the, that has not gone into effect. It's now in the Court of Appeals. It's likely to end up in the Supreme Court. Um, and you would think that our state would, since our state is trying to get the pre-existing conditions done away with, would be trying to come up with a plan B to protect people, um, but hasn't. Instead, we got the gimmick of the block grant, which only deals with TenCare, cuts TenCare, does nothing for the um, other four out of five Tennesseans um, who are not directly affected by TenCare, who are worrying about medical debt, who are worried about family members who have addictions and can't get treatment for their addictions because they lack insurance. It doesn't do anything and in fact goes the other direction in terms of addressing the fact that we have the highest rate of rural hospital closures in the country and in fact I just read this morning about the hospital in Oneida stopping admissions because the staff hasn't been paid and is not showing up to work. Uh, so the epidemic is continuing of rural hospital closures and although the block grant proposal talks about redirecting money to hospitals, um, that's kind of like you're taking money out of my wallet and then giving me uh, some quarters back uh, out of the dollar bill that you took from my wallet. The extra money in quotations that the state will have to redistribute is coming out of the health care system. Remember, $2 billion of money out of health care spending that would otherwise occur uh, for the state to realize $1 billion, the other $1 billion going to the federal government. And then, perhaps most troubling of all, we have 200,000 children who lost coverage. Um, the latest census data shows that we're uh, among the top three states in the country in terms of overall loss of coverage, uh, increase, in, increase in the numbers of uninsured um, citizens, and uh, we're waiting for the state-specific state data on children, but we, we know that 
probably among children, we will certainly be in the top and maybe number one in that doubtful distinction. So it's not really addressing the real problems, and this is a political gimmick. Uh, the the indica indicator of that is that it came out of the legislature. It didn't come out of uh, TenCare. It didn't come out of um, the health care task force that the governor promised that he would appoint but has yet to appoint. It didn't come out of the listening tour that uh, some cabinet officials went on earlier this year. It came out of the legislature. Um, and we just have to wonder why no other states have done this. And we can't help but point out that, by contrast, 30 other states, including uh, half of which are led by Republicans, have tapped the federal funds to expand Medicaid to working families. And um, it it's, continues to be uh, a, a major lost opportunity that the legislature has blocked Governor Haslam's Insure Tennessee plan that would have brought in $1.4 billion each year of new federal funds. And it's ironic and not a little bit tragic that instead the legislature is doubling down and proposing to take $2 billion more out of the existing system. So um, we believe that this is a uh, dire threat uh, to, to the welfare of Tennesseans, certainly those on TenCare, but many beyond that, for example, the threat to the rural health care system coming from taking more money out of the system and not addressing that the opioid epidemic, the ongoing issues. But you don't have to take it from us when we say that it's people with chronic illness and who are the most uh, seriously ill and need the most treatment who are at risk. Uh, we're not alone in this. All of these organizations uh, that are advocates for uh, people with chronic uh, disease conditions have uh, written to CMS uh, and issued a press statement opposing block grants because they understand the threat that it poses. The Washington Post when the legislature passed the law, uh, issued an editorial, published an editorial with this uh, terse but accurate uh, caption. So um, what do we do about this? Well, I'm going to turn it back to Kyle in well, a in a moment to talk about this. Uh, so let's, let me talk about the process uh, first. Um, and, before I do that, I just wanted to say why comment. Uh, frankly, uh, when we've seen uh, 10 care post amendments in the past, and as I said, this is Amendment 42, so over 25 years we've been down this track before. Um, frankly, the, the 10 care bureaus or divisions um, track record of responding to comments um, has not been very heartening. Um, generally, the changes are not made, if at all, or if they are, they're relatively minor. So you may be thinking, why would we submit comments? Well, let me explain why. Um, they are required by federal regulations, as I, as I mentioned, and most importantly, the federal comments uh, are, are ones that can lay the groundwork for uh, true scrutiny in the courts. So. Um, Two years ago, Kentucky proposed, um, and then followed by Arkansas, and then followed by New, more recently by New Hampshire, uh, instituted work reporting requirements that required uh, adults in those programs to um, report on their work activities in order to retain their health coverage. Um, they were ill-conceived. They were dangerous, incidentally. Tennessee followed that lead and has one pending now, a request for, a, for an even more draconian uh, waiver uh, that is pending before CMS and is yet to be acted on. But the ones that uh, took effect or were proposed before ours and that were approved by CMS have been blocked by the federal courts in the District of Columbia, which ruled that the CMS lacked the authority to grant approval. The waiver authority of the 
Secretary of Health and Human Services who operates through CMS is not broad. It has to be limited to uh, waiver proposals that will advance the purposes of the Medicaid Act. It can't just be to save money. Um, and it, the comments, CMS has to show that it has carefully considered comments submitted in opposition to a waiver proposal. It doesn't have to follow the comments. It doesn't have to accept the recommendations or, or accede to the objections of the commenters, but it has to show that it's carefully considered them. And uh, CMS has failed to do that. So um, it's important that substantive, thoughtful comments be submitted um, to the federal government um, and we don't want to assume that TenCare will ignore the comments, even though the track record is not encouraging. So we hope that people will submit comments during the state comment period and um, uh, here are our suggestions for, for your comments if you do comment. Um, we urge you to unequivocally oppose. Don't try to suggest changes because the fact of the matter is the, the structure of the grant, um, uh, I'm sorry, of the waiver proposal is such that it can't really be fixed. And so um, anything that suggests a change that it could be tweaked uh, makes your opposition ambiguous and you don't want to be ambiguous. So uh, please focus on the weaknesses. It's not our job to try to come up with a fix and in fact we know from experience that um, good faith suggestions to tweak it are likely to only be used by CMS um, as an excuse to approve something that is not a good idea. Uh, be specific and cite research and studies whenever possible. And the two points that we would suggest that you emphasize, you focus on, are the negative impact on the most vulnerable people who will bear the brunt, and the regulation of managed care organizations, the waiver of those restrictions are vital, will, will weaken protections which are vital both for program integrity and protecting the investment of taxpayers in this program and protecting patients who um, suffer when uh, poorly performing managed care contractors control their access to care. So if you represent an organization, uh, we recommend that you talk about the impact um, on the people that you serve or represent. If you are yourself a TenCare enrollee, uh, we hope that you will talk about um, any difficulties you've had dealing with TenCare, for example, with eligibility or other things where there have been errors or uh, administrative um, problems on the state's end or dealing with the MCO that suggests that TenCare um, should not be excused from being accountable for the quality um, and the legality of what it does. And if you use a lot of services, then please explain how, what your needs are and how uh, you or your family would be affected if those services were cut. And um, if you neither represent an organization nor uh, use TenCare yourself, that's okay. You don't, anyone can comment, and um, if you are a person who cares about your neighbors, we hope that you will comment about the concern that you have for how this will affect both TenCare enrollees and the general public. And certainly you can speak about your concern as a taxpayer about not getting value for the dollars that go into this program. Thanks so much, Gordon. So as we mentioned, uh, the deadline for the state comment period, which is going on right now, is October 18th, 2019. So please submit a comment before this deadline during the state comment period, but also know that there'll be a federal comment period later. Gordon mentioned this earlier. Um, but really want to put that on your radar that later this year or early next year there will be a federal comment period. It's really vitally important that anyone who submitted comments during the state comment period resubmits those comments 
or include additional research or anything for the federal comment period. The federal comment period, again, is vitally important in building that record um, that CMS needs to carefully consider when deciding to approve this waiver. Um, and it is really important that the federal comment period, everyone submits their comments or resubmits them. So just emphasizing that again. Um, we are going to send out an easily template that you can use to submit comments that'll have some suggested talking points, some guidance, and we'll also have guidance for writing longer comments. So if you're writing, for example, from an organization, you're citing research about the importance um, of Medicaid for your organization and what could be impacted, et cetera, um, we'll provide guidance that includes some of the points that we mentioned in this PowerPoint, but a little bit more extensive along with a template. But if you are just an individual, we'll have a very easy way that you can take two minutes just to submit a comment based on a template. We encourage you to, uh, there'll be an option to edit and add in more information from your experience. And we know everyone on this call has a depth of experience and firsthand knowledge. We really encourage you to please just take a couple minutes to write something of your own voice, of your own experience. Perhaps people who you serve on TenCare, uh, if your family relies on TenCare, et cetera. So please take the time to make that comment unique. Um, so we'll be sending out this very easy template that you can use in the guidance shortly. Um, as a follow-up to this webinar, it will be disseminating more broadly as well. Um, but if you want to go separately and just submit your comments, the email address where you can email them in during the state comment period is on the screen. And again, we'll send out this slide deck so you can make sure to have access to that as well. It will be different during the federal comment period. There'll be a, a portal on the CMS website, so just FYI. But for the state comment period, that is the email address that you would use to submit your public comment. There will also be three public hearings where the state is accepting comments that people want to make in person. Um, they're required to do these public hearings and it is a way, again, like I said, to submit a public comment in person. The dates are coming right up. The first one is in Nashville uh, next Tuesday, October 2nd at 2 p.m. There will also be one in Knoxville and then one in Jackson. We encourage folks to attend. If there's media present, we encourage you to explain to media um, your opposition to the proposal, how it could impact uh, you or the people who you serve. Um, so please you know, attend these as well and make sure to make it clear that you oppose it um, and to show to the media that you are in opposition to the proposal. And if you want to get more involved, there are other ways that you can oppose this harmful proposal. So TJC is posting on our uh, Facebook page and our Twitter page. Um, please share that content that will have the uh, way, the easy portal to submit a comment. Please share that and get 10 of your friends to submit a comment. It's really important that we uh, submit as many comments as possible. Uh, earlier this year, we had uh, another harmful Medicaid proposal that so many of you uh, acted to oppose and we ended up for that proposal submitting during the federal comment period 13,778 comments. That means that Tennessee was the leader in the nation on submitting comments to oppose a harmful Medicaid proposal of that sort. So let's keep up our track record of engagement and submitting comments and being the, the leader in the nation in submitting uh, the number of comments opposing a proposal. So we need you to share the content on social media and get the word out to your friends. Um, you could get people in your church to write a comment as well, or people in your book club, whatever group that you're a part of. Um, also, we really are trying to promote uh, more information about the proposal. There's a lot of confusion. There's a lot of, it's confusing, and that's one reason we're doing this webinar, but we would love for everyone to submit letters to the editor that it can explain pieces of this proposal and how harmful it is, how it impacts your family, how it impacts people who you know, or just calling out some of the very harmful pieces of this proposal. There's a lot of national media coverage in addition to state media coverage. We want to make sure that it's clear that people are opposing this. Um, so please submit a letter to the editor opposing this harmful proposal. And finally, if you want to volunteer, take further action, Again, I'm going to send out these PowerPoint slides that'll have this survey 
and you can fill out that survey with how you want to engage and what other actions you want to take. And we would love to have you as involved as you want to be. So with that, I know we have a lot of questions. Um, so I want to now turn it over to questions. If you have questions that you have not yet submitted, please submit them in the question and answer box, which you'll find on your screen. And we'll be able to address as many questions as we have time for. And if, we, if there are questions that we don't get to, um, we will try to answer them in follow-up. Exactly. All right, so our first question comes, says, uh, what can be done to ask or demand a public hearing in the Memphis area, the second largest city in Tennessee and one of the cities with the largest percentage of black residents in the country? Uh, good question. Um, House Minority Leader uh, Representative K Karen Camper from Shelby County um, has asked for hearing in Memphis, as I believe uh, Congressman Cohen has as well. Um, the, the impact of this these cuts because they fall uh, disproportionately on um, people with chronic illness will have a disproportionate impact uh, if the waiver is granted on uh, people of color, specifically African Americans. And the reason why we know that is that the incidence of chronic illness uh, is significantly higher uh, among uh, minority Tennesseans. And they bear the burden of um, greater disease and therefore greater uh, medical need. So if you're going to follow the Lily Sutton principle and go after the high cost, uh, that means you go after the high cost patients and that's going to fall on communities of color disproportionately. So to not have a hearing in uh, Memphis, I think, is really um, uh, telling, I think, in terms of the insensitivity to uh, what this what this could do to health inequities and disparities in our state. Thank you. Um, there's another comment that hospital, Tennessee hospital managers seem to be conspicuously absent from the public discourse on this subject. Any insight on their block grant policy position? Um, the Tennessee Hospital Association has um, made statements of optimism, um, maybe even support. Um, but specific hospital systems um, have been quite concerned and quite explicit in stating that they think that this is a threat um, to their patients and a threat uh, to the healthcare system that, that, that everyone relies on. Um, so I, you'd have to ask the hospital association why it takes the position that it does, but I think, again, looking at national groups like the Cancer Society and the Heart Association um, whose only interest is the welfare of their patients. Um, they are unambiguous and full-throated in expressing their opposition. I might just add that one thing that's of note um, is that the um, there are some exclusions from the block grant, and one of those is from a special fund that the hospital association helps administer um, that makes payments directly to hospitals. Thanks, Gordon. Another question is, does the proposal mandate that MCOs remain in place, or does it open a door for an ASO? Um, it really just, if the proposal were approved, it would do away with um, any federal regulation of managed care organizations that contract um, with the state. So whether that would open the door to an ASO, I don't know, but it, it um, I would think that since it does away with federal standards for entities that contract um, for the administration of benefits for Medicaid patients, um, it, it would it would just open the door entirely. Yeah. Another question comes about the impact on the Katie Beckett waiver. What the what we estimate the impact on the uh, Katie Beckett waiver might be of the Medicaid block grant proposal. Well, the the waiver proposal says that it will exempt. Um, 
certain populations um, very narrowly. It, it, it will exempt Medicare beneficiaries and it will exempt um, certain medically fragile children, which would include the Katie Beckett program. However, um, it's important to understand that no one is really protected because um, it creates enormous financial pressure uh, to reduce the program and to cut, cut eligibility. Uh, you can cut the program in a couple of ways. You can cut who gets it and you can also cut how much they get. They're being explicit about saying we want to be able to cut how much services people get. And if you take enough money out of the program because a dollar is a dollar and a dollar not spent here means a dollar that could be spent someplace else, really you can't put the, 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 any of the ten care budget beyond the reach of budget cutters. It's important to know that part of what they would propose is that they be able to spend what's now a ten care dollar in other parts of the state budget um, and replace uh, funds that, that would go, for example, to Katie Beckett, they could conceivably uh, take money ultimately and spend it on something unrelated. Um, so it, that's kind of in the technical weeds, but when you look at the maintenance of that lack of meaningful maintenance of effort um, and what they propose to be able to do in terms of flexibility, there's an illusion um, to think that anybody who currently or hopes to rely on TenCare in the future will be protected. Um, all bets are off, really. Great. Thanks, Gordon. So continue submitting your questions. We're getting a lot more as well. Um, but wanted to uh, just kind of skim through. Uh, one thing to add about Katie Beckett is um, it, 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 this is the new program for people not familiar with it. It's a new program that uh, was recently was just adopted by the legislature. Um, it's in the waiver process now. It is a very benign waiver amendment and one that we strongly support, along with the Disability Co Tennessee Disability Coalition, which led the effort to get that through along with a lot of dedicated parents of special needs kids. So we, we applaud that, um, but um, again, I think everyone needs to be concerned that although that was a great accomplishment, it, it's fragile if this block grant goes through. Okay. We had another question just asking to explain a bit more about the $2 billion loss to the program because the way TenCare is explaining the proposal of splitting the money with the federal government, it sounds like Tennessee would gain significantly more money rather than less. So, just... Yes, what's, what is being proposed is that, um, uh, the, as Governor Lee said, uh, the hope is to, to achieve a billion dollars in savings. Now, because we're dividing half of any savings with the federal government, in order for Tennessee to get $1 billion in savings, it would have to wring $2 billion out of the program because half of that is going to go to the feds. Um, there's some funny math in the proposal. Um, the, way, the way it would work is it would project what the state would spend without the waiver, and then if it comes in below that target, uh, it would keep half of any savings against that target. Um, we doubt that the feds will approve it as it's written uh, because they, it basically changes the funding formula in a way that, that the secretary can't approve. But what has us very worried is that if you take out the protections against cuts in benefits and give the state the flexibility they're asking for and the incentives, um, the strong incentives to cut TenCare and use the money elsewhere, um, then um, whether the 
funding formula is approved or not, it creates a lot of pressure, those other changes to those patient and provider safeguards once those are gone and the state is authorized to move money out of TenCare and use it on other things, then um, we, will, we will end up um, in, a, in a serious uh, deficit in terms of being able to cover provider expenses and cover patients. So um, the, we don't believe that the, the financing arrangement that's proposed, which would be highly favorable to the state, compared to the federal government will be approved and we worry very much that once the negotiations start we know that the current administration in Washington has set targets for drastic reductions in TenCare guidance that was issued last year by CMS um, just to talk technical terms for a moment our waiver has a budget neutrality cap, which means that we can't spend more under the waiver than we would without the waiver in terms of federal money. And that's been calculated in a way that's been pretty liberal, pretty favorable to the state. We want to reopen. This waiver proposal would reopen that, and that's very dangerous because CMS, CMS issued guidance last year indicating they intend to change the way that's done. So this is a dangerous conversation to get into, dangerous for Patients dangerous for providers. So building on that, what are some of the optional programs that the state could remove? Um, there, uh, well, pharmacy for one, although it seems unlikely that that, that would be eliminated altogether. Um, physical therapy, various forms of therapy, um, case management services, um, the. Some of those are very important, like physical therapy, and they could be eliminated immediately under the waiver. I think the much bigger threat is that even mandatory services, services the state has to provide, such as hospitalization, physician uh, visits, um, those can be cut down to practically nothing. So if, if you have the power to reduce those without any uh, limit, then that's tantamount to being able to eliminate them in all but name. Okay. Um, I have another question. Other than cost savings, what are the arg administration's arguments on behalf of the block grant proposal and how can we effectively counter those arguments? Well, the, the, the main argument is that it's going to be, I mean, they've been pretty blunt about, and the governor's been blunt about this is going to generate a lot more money um, for the state, and I think we just have to point out that um, it's money that's coming out of the health care system uh, at the expense of the health care providers, at the expense of patients, and at the expense of the public that depends upon the health care infrastructure. So it's, it's an illusion to talk about bringing in new dollars. Yes, it's new dollars to the state budget, but it's not new dollars to the state. It's actually coming out of other pockets. Uh, so that's the first argument. That's about the fiscal impact. Um, the, the second argument is that the state um, can run things much more effectively and efficiently um, without federal oversight. And again, I think we only have to point to our track record regulating managed care companies that led to much fraud and abuse and our poor performance when it comes to maintaining coverage for children. I don't know anybody in, in the administration or elsewhere who's said that they're proud of the fact that we cut off 200,000 children from TenCare and we don't know how many of them are actually ineligible. Most of them probably are still eligible, but were cut off because of administrative problems. Um, that's not a track record that anybody can brag about. And, and even if you take the representation that the TenCare makes in the waiver, which is we're more efficiently run than any other state, well then, if that's the case, you're not going to wring additional efficiencies out of the system. The only place to go is to actually cut in, into the meat, into the bone. So we only have a couple more minutes. I know we have a lot more questions that we haven't gotten to yet. So we'll answer just a couple more. And uh, if we don't get time to answer your question, we'll be sending out written answers after the webinar. 
Um, so we had another question when we were talking about how the proposal seeks to reduce the amount of care a patient could receive. Um, we gave an example of how the state could go back to the former policy of covering only 14 days a year of inpatient hospital care. And the question was, um, does that restriction also apply to mental health and substance use treatment? And if so, doesn't that constitute a parity violation? Well, um, I want to make clear the state has not said that it's going to go back to 14 days in the hospital. What it said is we want the authority to set the benefits at any level that we choose without notice and without any kind of review and with no standard. Again, it's not just removing the, the, the traffic cop, it's removing the speed limits. So um, I just want to make that clear. Parity laws are part of statutes and they can't be waived by CMS. So the good news is that um, mental health care will be treated the same um, even if the waiver is granted as uh, physical conditions. The bad news is that both of those uh, could be cut with, with no safeguards in place. Great, thanks. Um, and yes, we can see your questions. We just have a lot coming in, so we're trying to answer all of them as much as we can. And again, we'll definitely send out written guidance um, around these questions as well. So if we don't have time to answer your question, we're just going to answer one more. We'll send out written, uh, a written answer to you. So don't worry, we will get to your question. Um, the last one that I wanted to address is the format for uh, public hearings and how to, you know, give, uh, what to expect at those public hearings, what the format may be or the agenda. Um, in our experience, there will be a brief description by 10 care representatives of the waiver, and then the floor will be open. Um, there is not necessarily a lot of give and take. Uh, comments are recorded and um, are supposed to be taken into account before the final state uh, proposal is submitted to CMS. Um, frankly, we believe that it's probably more valuable to go to the hearing um, just to show that there is public concern. Uh, we expect them to be covered by the media and um, we think it, it is important to give the media opportunity to connect with people who are concerned about this. So um, we don't, we don't have hold out of hope for altering what gets sent to CMS, but we think it's still important in terms of raising uh, these issues with the public through the media. Perfect. Thanks, Gordon. I know there's also the question, um, what is more important, a public comment or a letter to the editor? And I hate to be the person who says both, but... But you just are. But I am that person right now. So both are really important. It's important to submit a public comment. Again, we're going to make it very easy, so it only will take a couple minutes. But again, as Gordon was saying, we need the press coverage around this to reflect that people are opposed and that this is a very harmful proposal. There's been a lot of confusion in the press, and we want to make sure that it's showing that People are opposed, and the letters to the editor are a great way to do that, and showing up to the public hearing to talk to the media are another great way to do that, or even just showing up to the public hearing to show that you are in opposition. So with that, um, we're going to wrap up. Again, I will send a copy of the recording of the webinar, the slides to the webinar, and uh, I will make sure that anyone who had a question that was not answered, um, we get an answer to you, and we'll have, follow up with all of that. Thank you all so much, and I hope you all have a great rest of your day.